We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they, were, they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of his human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. Seen from this point of view, the mental reactions of the inmates of a concentration camp must seem more to us than the mere expression of certain physical and sociological conditions. Even though conditions such as lack of sleep, insufficient food, and various mental stresses may suggest that the inmates were bound to react in certain ways, in the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. Fundamentally, therefore, any man can, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him, mentally and spiritually. He may re retain his human dignity even in a concentration camp. Dostoevsky said once, There is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. These words frequently came to mind after I became acquainted with those martyrs whose behaviors in camp, whose suffering and death bore witness to the fact that the last inner freedom cannot be lost. It can be said that they are worthy of their sufferings. The way they bore their suffering was a genuine inner achievement. It is this spiritual freedom, which cannot be taken away, that makes life meaningful and purposeful. So that is a reading from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And anytime you study the atrocities of the 20th century, and in this case, the Holocaust, you're confronted by the harrowing realities of man's capacity for evil. In the senior elective I teach here at Gilman, my students read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and we discuss how humans could participate in and inflict such an affront to humanity. But we also discuss how the inmates of concentration camps could ever find spiritual freedom, the will to endure, and amazingly, a sense of meaning in such devastating conditions that characterize a place like Auschwitz. Sitting across from me today is an expert on the devastations of the 20th century. And I really look forward to talking to Kevin Hudson about how, how such a nightmare was ever realized in the 30s and how rational people could ever follow and buy into the evil influence of someone like Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. I would also like to dive into how World War II played out the influence of Winston Churchill and the entry of Japan in the Second World War. Kevin Hudson is a history teacher at Gilman School, a scholar of World War I and World War II, an international trip leader, assistant lacrosse coach, and an esteemed colleague. Kevin, welcome to the Path to Follow podcast. Uh, thanks for having me today, Jake. So I want to talk to you a little bit first about Maybe we can talk about what you do here at Gilman and how you formulated the courses that you teach here. Um, so I wear a number of hats here at Gilman. I um, first and foremost uh, teach uh, history, European history to sophomores. And then uh, over the last six years, I've taught three different senior electives, um, initially one in modern Far East Asian history, uh, our World War II elective. Um, and then two years ago, I was really fortunate to get to uh, pick up our World War I elective and actually develop the course from scratch. So decide how I wanted to teach it and put the curriculum together. And that was, uh, that was a tall task a couple of summers ago, but it's, uh, it's absolutely my favorite course to teach. Um, beyond teaching, as you mentioned, I'm an assistant lacrosse coach. So I work for Coach Nostrant, I'm the faculty chair of the honor committee, um, and then uh, Perhaps most importantly, I lead our on-campus Bible study focus. I've been, I've been loving going to those Bible studies, by the way. Every Wednesday, it's a highlight. Well, you put a smile on my face when you showed up. I hope you'll continue. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful time of the week. 
Yeah, it really is. And I think Wednesday is an important day, especially during this <laughs> this time, just that break in the week and the Bible study offers community, all the things that I feel like we are missing right now, um, kind of a sense of, uh, of hope and spirituality within the community, which is like a staple of what Gilman is. Yeah, I mean, this past fall, the, uh, the, the curriculum has focused on Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which are the fruit of the spirit. And each week we try to provide a specific fruit that is a reflection of God's indwelling um, in, in, in believers and, um, and just give the boys words of encouragement and sort of a, a mission as they leave each Wednesday as to how to apply the fruit that we studied that week, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long series, but it's been really great. Yeah. You know, I just th I just like that feeling on, on Wednesdays. <laughs> we got the Chick-fil-A and yeah. then we have some prayers and some Bible verse readings and it's it's a great sense of community that that you are building and there's so many guys that come out for that which is yeah the great numbers to see. Are, numbers are crazy we're over 80 yeah. 80 boys and faculty and I love the fact that we now have eight to ten faculty who come consistently yeah so thank you for your for your work with that it's been it's been great it's it's a blessing so maybe we can talk about your World War II uh, course and and maybe. Thinking back to what first start, sparked your interest in the study of that war and kind of how, um, as I read from Man's Search for Meaning, how those atrocities were permitted or, or came to be in Europe in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a big question that we try to we try to um, come to grips with with the boys each year. Um, it's funny, my passion about military history, I think, dates all the way back to um, my childhood. Um, and I'm not supposed to say this at Gilman, but I actually attended McDonough uh, when I was younger. And um, when I attended McDonough's in, starting in the late 60s, it was an all boys military academy. And um, I absolutely loved that environment. And um, it instilled not only a respect for the military, but a tremendous appreciation, um, you know, for the men and women, specifically then the McDonough men who had made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for their country in the wars of the 20th century. And um, monuments and photographs and murals are all about that campus. And it's just, um, it made such an impression on me that I, you know, it, it, my passion grew from there. And um and then much later in life, you know, I spent 11 years living in London and you cannot get away from the reverence um, the English have for uh, the two wars. It had such an impact on their country, um, certainly the Great War far more so than on the United States, um, but World War II also, um, you know, they remember their war dead. They remember their veterans. We just had Remembrance Day um, last week, and that's something that I really try to um, emphasize for our students here. You know, Veterans Day tends to go by without a lot of um, recognition, and I think that's very sad in this country. Uh, whereas in the in the UK, um, it's a big day, and everyone uh, takes a moment at eleven o'clock to reflect on what has happened over the last, um, you know, the last century and the sacrifice those men made in the Great War. So I think that's those are sorts of the roots of my passion. Um, to go to the bigger question of like, how could this have happened, right? How could this have happened um, with regards to the atrocities of the 30s and 40s? And you sort of need to take a step back to the latter part of the 19th century. Um, with, um, I think, the unexpected um, uh, consequences of, of social Darwinism, as well as uh, the popularity of philosophy by the likes of Friedrich Nietzsche. And when you combine um, almost a, a disrespect for the sanctity of life, you, you head down a path of of, of sort of dehumanization, of categorizing people based on ethnicity or appearance or faith. And then you couple that with uh, 
a philosophy that says might makes right. You're just the cauldron for horrific behavior is being uh, stirred. And that manifests itself in the 20s and 30s when um, members of the Nazi party sort of embrace this ideology. And then you layer it with German Volkish thought. I mean, you can just go on and on and on um, in terms of the perfect storm of a of, of very warped um, thinking such that um, people readily accepted these atrocities in Germany. And, and, and to this day, no one can make complete sense of it. So many people witness this happening. And you talked about the cauldron brewing during the latter half of the 1800s into the early 1900s. Why didn't anyone say, you know, this is wrong or, or um, kind of speak up on behalf of like the good, the goodness of mankind and say, wait, we're going too far or, you know, offer a, a different direction for you know, the way that these this rhetoric was going? Well, I think that has to do with your perspective of man's nature, right? And left unchecked, man has a tremendous capacity for evil. And that's been the case since the beginning. And I find that, you know, it's easy with hindsight to say, why didn't some people speak up? And some did. Mm -hmm. um, there were certainly movements in Germany early on which opposed uh, the Nazi party. But once the party came to power in 33, those people were were eliminated. Right. They were they were the first to go to Dachau. Right. It was political prisoners. Um, and then they were uh, ultimately, um, you know, executed. So it's not that no one spoke up. Uh, but I do think that um, man has an innate capacity for evil, and um, it left unchecked, he will he will he will pursue those self interests. So, um, and man's arrogant. I mean, think about a lot of what people were buying into throughout the uh, the nineteenth century. Um, there was a lot of arrogance. And on behalf of the German people during that time, there was a lot of resentment and willingness to blame because of World War One, How did Hitler and, his, and Hitler's rise, how did he uh, play off of this resentment of the German people and kind of use, I, I think Carl Jung talked about the collective unconscious of the German people and Hitler was like, he was a mouthpiece for that. Well, I think, um, I think you have to look at, uh, at the Treaty of Versailles and how that was negotiated um, to, to, to kind of get a handle around that. I think you have to look at the fact that first, during the Great War, no battle was fought on German soil. So to the German civilian population, they couldn't believe they'd lost the war. Yes, many families lost young men, just as the French and the Brits did. But they had never been occupied. They had never seen um, warfare on their soil. We all know most of the fighting took place in, in France and Belgium. Uh, so when the treaty was negotiated, um, the men that negotiated the treaty, right, were the uh, were those that succeeded the Kaiser. So you have this young republic, you have, uh, for the most part, social democrats who are uh, working on behalf of the new Weimar Republic negotiating a treaty and it was very easy and 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 by the way a very draconian treaty right but it was very easy for the um for the likes of an adolf hitler to look at that treaty and say our party and and i have many speeches by hitler that basically say our party didn't negotiate this treaty right this is not our belief so our platform is to set aside the terms of that treaty right and to make germany great once again and um, you know, the German people historically have had are, are, are a proud people. And so um, if you didn't witness the war firsthand and you felt that you'd been sold out and you're struggling, which they were economically in the 1920s, like much of the world was struggling, um, this was a message with great appeal. Mm -hmm. 
And Hitler served in World War One, and he saw he was on the front, and he saw the devastation of the Great War. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we like to we like to jokingly say he acquired the great rank of corporal. Um, he he also received an Iron Cross. So I mean, he again, as a native Austrian, fought for Germany um, in the war um, and received a cross for valor. So yeah, of course, he saw the devastation of the war. How did his um, what what skills did he have as a speaker? And that's something that has interested me just about his rise and his ability to persuade the masses and orate and kind of channel the anger and the resentment of the people through his his words. Because you see, like growing up, you see videos of Hitler in front of you know thousands and yeah. thousands of people at his at his mass rallies and. People are roaring at you know what he's saying, and he's he's almost in conversation or he's playing off of the crowd in a lot of ways. Um, I'm just curious about like the the makeup of Hitler as a man, and maybe that's not something that's that's talked a lot about is like how his personality gave rise to this movement. Yeah, I mean Hitler, um, he wasn't always successful. So if you recall, in the early years, he failed. Um, he attempted a putsch, which is a coup in 1923, the Munich Beer Hall putsch, um, and, and ended up in jail. Um, and uh, so at that time, the, the Nazi party was just a fringe movement of, of a few dozen men. Um, and, and while in jail, right, he spent the time uh, to write Mein Kampf and, 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 and actually put pen to paper to lay out his ideology and his visions uh, for Germany going forward. But I think he was a gifted orator. Uh, he practiced his speeches over and again before he made them, uh, much like Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was a gifted orator, not naturally. It came through perseverance and practice and work. And um, so oratory skills can take you far when people are receptive for a different message. And um, at the time, the Weimar Republic wasn't delivering what the German people wanted, needed, and he did. But again, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It it was a decade. Mm -hmm. It was a decade. And and during that decade, there was quite a bit, quite a bit of turmoil, quite a bit of um, economic unrest. And when Hitler emerges uh, legitimately appointed by Hindenburg in 1933, um, it, it was a long time coming. How did Hitler and Goebbels uh, use propaganda and the radio and the different means of media at the time to use their persuasion and their oratory skills on the, on the masses? Well, I, I think the answer is they used them brilliantly. Um, again, radio was readily available, um, but it went further than that, right? They used film amazingly effectively. Uh, if you think about Lenny Reifenstahl's film, Triumph of the Will, which was produced um, in 1935, and it was based on the 1934 Nuremberg rallies that were held each year. I mean, each year the Nazis would come together in Nuremberg and gather in, in hundreds of thousands for rallies. Um, that film was used throughout the 30s. You couldn't go, uh, as they say in Germany, you couldn't go to Das Kino, right? You couldn't go to the films. You couldn't go watch your, your Humphrey Bogart feature film um, until you'd had your, your mandatory 30 minutes of Triumph of the Will. So it was constantly uh, placed in front of the German people, and uh, it was very um, intoxicating. So I'm interested in in this class you teach on World War II and, and kind of some of the units or discussions that you uh, use in your class. And, and what do you think, you know, are the most um, interesting or maybe your favorite lessons to teach uh, high school students? Well, it's um, it's tough to teach a course on World War II in one semester. Right. Right. It, it really year. could be a, it could be a four year course you yeah. know, if we if we did it properly. Um, and, we, you know, we have to start we have to start uh, 
we, we start in the latter part of the 19th century. We have to look, for instance, at the Franco-Prussian War, and then we have to look at the things that contributed to the Great War. And then from the Great War, we have to move through the 20s and 30s. So, I mean, to really lay the foundations of World War II. Um, I don't focus extensively on battles because I don't think that's the approach we should take, although we spend time looking at very significant events. So Stalingrad, of course, which was a turning point in 42, um, D-Day, because that's when the Americans are finally involved on the continent. So we do work through a bit of chronology, but interestingly, my um, the unit I think that has the greatest impact on the students is the unit that we, um, we teach on the rape of Nanking. Hmm. Because while American students tend to be familiar with the atrocities that were committed in Western Europe, they're less familiar with the atrocities that the Japanese committed in China. And so we do spend time, and, and I think this is because I teach it in both the you know, modern um, Far East Asian history course as well as, as the World War II course. There's overlap between the two. But um, you know, to look at Japanese policies in China and Korea, starting in 31 with the invasion of Manchuria and then tracing it through to the invasion of mainland China in 37 and the atrocities committed in, in Nanking is such an eye opener, such an eye opener for the students. And it's a very tough topic uh, to teach. There's a, um, there's a fantastic documentary out called Nanking, uh, which we watch. And the reason it's so valuable is, um, I think it was produced in 07, and um, they had interviews with um, not only the victims who, who endured the rape of Nanking, Chinese victims, but they also had interviews with uh, Japanese soldiers who committed the atrocities. And um, the juxtaposition of what these victims endured and the lack of remorse of the Japanese soldiers who conducted this is awful. Yeah, it's shocking. It's awful. Um, and I think that's such an important piece of history that our students need to know about beyond what went on, you know, in the Western campaigns. Right. How did, um, so after Nanking was 37, so what, how did the West hold Japan accountable for what happened in the mainland of China after that date? Well, they really didn't, right? They really didn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, the failure of the League of Nations, um, which, you know, was uh was was sort of the uh i guess the ancestor of of the united nations but it was even less effective because it had no military presence whatsoever required unanimous consent for any decisions it made that sort of behavior just continued to to further embolden western um dictators like hitler like mm -hmm. mussolini like stalin so they didn't do anything yeah there's nothing in place to stop those powers from rising. Right. Um, interesting. So Nanking in 37, and then what was the um, process of countries like Britain and the United States and their involvement in the war? And, and when they finally decide to enter and say, this is, this is going too far, we need to stop our isolationist, you know, practices and, and get involved here. Well, they're distinctly different. So um, Britain is drawn into the war in 39 with the invasion of Poland. Um, Poland was a country that had been created after, after the Great War. Um, it hadn't existed prior to that. It's, it, it's, it's sort of shown up uh, from time to time in history, but it existed in earnest um, following the Great War. So you see the, uh, the creation of new countries like um, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Um, Britain was committed to Poland's neutrality when Hitler invades Poland in September of 39. Um, Great Britain declares war on Germany. Um, but at the time, Great Britain was not in a position to engage on the continent. So she actually finds herself on the back foot for the first 18 months of the war in what's known as the Battle of Britain. 
So um, Germany, after her invasion of 39, goes into sort of a quiet period until the spring of 40. And then it's the spring of 40 that she invades Belgium and France. England have a few hundred thousand troops, the British Expeditionary Force, on the ground. Um, and that's the, that's the famous incident at Dunkirk, right? The evacuation of the men um, at Dunkirk in, the, in, in May um, and early June of 40. But then England is isolated and um, Hitler is constantly looking across the channel thinking, can we invade? Um, and um, Hitler tried to soften up the Brits with what's known as the Battle of the uh, the Battle of Britain. And she would send, um, you know, Germany would send her planes across the English Channel, attacking uh, defensive positions in the cities and things like that. And that's where the real resolve of the British people was tested, and where we see the tremendous leadership of Winston Churchill um, in those early years. Um, and hit, uh, uh, but England, like the United States, did not have boots on the ground until 44, right? They landed with us at D-Day. England were involved in um, the North African campaign in the early 40s, and the U.S. ultimately by 43 has boots on the ground in Africa and then begins the invasion of Italy. But, you know, France, England is, is not involved. So England just had to bear the the bombings from forty, you know, for yeah, it, it, you know, the Battle of Britain lasted about um, roughly nine to twelve months. And was Hitler's was Germany's tactic during that time just to get Britain to wave the white flag and just say we're we're just turn to yeah. Germany and and the leadership of Winston Churchill and kind of refraining from doing that was ultimately what led the allies to win the war, right? Yeah, I mean, Winston Churchill um, gave a lot of famous speeches. If, if you think Hitler's a great orator, Churchill's the greatest. Hmm. And uh, the speeches that he gave, I think, as I said, contributed to the tremendous resolve of the British people. Um, it is nice to have the channel right between you and the continent. It's it's tough to, to stage a landing across the English Channel. Um, and Hitler was ultimately discouraged by the British resolve and turns his attention to, to, to the Soviet Union in 41, which was perhaps his great mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and we can't overlook the fact that Britain had a great friendship. I mean, Winston Churchill had a very close relationship with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And um, while the U.S. was not involved at the, in the war at that point, I mean, we're drawn in in 41, but we're drawn into the Pacific, right? That becomes our, um, you know, sphere of war. And we're not involved in Europe until, of course, 44. Churchill was not respected at first when he when he became prime minister and he was he wasn't immediately um, looked at as the type of leader that he would historically become. But it, it took some time for his speeches and his influence to kind of pervade England and, and get them to buy in. Am I right yeah, in saying that? Yeah, I think so. I think, I mean, he didn't have an unblemished career. If you, if you think about Winston Churchill, um, he was uh, he was a man of privilege. Um, he grew up at Blenheim. Um, you know, he is, uh, he's, he's directly descended from the Duke of Marlborough. Um, his mom's an American though, which was great because that really, that gave, he had such an affinity for the United States and the United States, I think, could find affinity for him. Um, but I mean, in World War One, he was the uh, first admiral um, or the first, I forget exactly his title, but, um, you know, he uh, structured the Gallipoli campaigns, which were a failure. I mean, the losses were horrific and the Brits had to pull out of the Dardanelles and uh, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. He lost his job. And remember, he also switched parties. In his early life, he was a member of labor. But by the time World War I, uh, World War II started, he was a member of the Conservative Party. So he had crossed the aisle, which in England is not taken lightly. And so I think that, um, yeah, I mean, anything was better than Chamberlain. I mean, the policies of appeasement. Hitler, I mean, I mean Churchill was calling Hitler out for what he was early on. And I think the Brits and Chamberlain had hoped that the policies of appeasement might work, but um, that was clearly not the case. 
once Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia and um, and Poland. There's a chapter in in Malcolm Gladwell's talking to strangers about Neville Chamberlain coming back to Britain after meeting with Churchill and meeting with Hitler or meeting with Hitler. Sorry, and uh, and kind of thinking that they had struck a an appeasement and a deal and. You know, he and that gives was totally this, wrong. This famous speech, he gets off the plane and he holds up a document and he says, it is peace in our time. I mean, what an awkward speech to make in hindsight. Yeah. But I think, and, and this could be a different conversation, but, I, and this kind of goes back to our, you know, how we began the podcast, but I think some of the ways that we look at history today, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, could be to a degree totally unfair because when you're living through times like these, you have no idea how the events will actually play out and you're making decisions in real time. Today, when we look back and we, you know, I feel like in, to some degree, we're pretty judgmental of, of a lot of the things that occurred. And if we were living in that time, we would have a totally different interpretation of, you know, how we might act in, in that situation. I absolutely couldn't agree with you more. I think if there is one discipline I try to instill in the boys here, no matter which history course that I teach, is that if we're going to approach history from an academic perspective that has any degree of integrity, we have to evaluate history in context. And it is unfair for us to bring our perspective and our hindsight to bear as we judge and evaluate people and events. And so, um, it's very dangerous to get drawn into the temptation of revisionist history um, because that's just not academically sound. So I agree with you completely. And it's very difficult, right, especially for young people, um, if they haven't studied history extensively, to try to bring their perspective or 21st century perspectives to bear on men who lived 100, 150, 200 years ago. Um, why do that? Different time, different context, different events happening in the world, different mindset. Yes. It's, you know, I, I just think today, some of the things that, that are happening in the world today and in the United States, for sure, you know, we look back at history with such a judgmental lens. Mm -hmm. And I try to do something similar in my classes and think about, you know, how might you have acted if you were in this position if you were you know a german during world war ii and the rise of hitler and it's scary to think about but you know that's kind of what you have to do you kind of have to um, confront your own capacity for evil and and you started off the podcast saying man does have an everlasting capacity for evil and you're, you know thinking about that is i think an important exercise absolutely or else uh, history will repeat itself and Kevin, I'd like to talk a little bit also about um, some of the United States presidents and particularly Eisenhower, because I've always been into studying the presidents and learning about the presidents. And Eisenhower always struck me as an interesting figure um, in American and in world history. Um, just interested about your how you teach Eisenhower in your courses and you know what kind of leader he was. Well, now, now you're getting, um, I'm getting out of my uh, field of expertise. Oh, is this out? Yeah, okay. because to be honest, I know Ike as the, the general who led the African campaign in World War II. Mm -hmm. But having never taught American history, I haven't focused much on American presidents. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah. You, you don't focus much on FDR either in your... Uh, to an extent, but not as much. I mean, I do think that I have more of a Eurocentric approach to World War II. Um, so, yeah, we look at FDR a bit, but not in great depth. Interesting. So I teach this course on leadership. And, mm -hmm. you know, even though it's it, we started out with a course or a curriculum on moral leadership, we are talking about Hitler and his rise and how he gained in, impact uh, during the 30s. What are some of the other leaders you talk about in your courses during this, and even World War I, too, that stick out to you? Well, I think um, within the context of, of, the, of the Great War, we talk about the Kaiser, of course. Um, we talk about um, Franz Josef, who was the, um, the emperor of the Austrian Empire 
from 1848 to 1916. That's a good run. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly take a look at um, you know the leaders in, in Great Britain at the time, Lloyd George. Um, France was always in transition, uh, but we look at some of the um, the famous military leaders in France, like Henri Pétain, who shows up again as the president of the Vichy regime um, in World War II, when France is is divided into occupied and unoccupied France. Um, in World War II, we take a very hard look at uh, Benito Mussolini, um, obviously Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill. Uh, I don't know and much Joseph about Stalin. I don't know much about Mussolini. Yeah, so I mean, Mussolini um, really cast the die that um, that Hitler imitated. So fascism is not a German movement. Fascism originated in Italy. Uh, so everything that Hitler uh, copied had sort of been tried and successfully implemented by Mussolini by the, the, the mid-1920s. So um, again, a, a, a chameleon-like character, an opportunist, uh, originally as a young man was a, was a socialist slash communist. Uh, coming out of the war, similar appeal, uh, appealed to um, disenchanted war veterans who felt that Italy had been shortchanged when it came to territorial concessions at the end of the Great War. And... Um, you know, preyed on people's fears, preyed on economic insecurity, and really offered, um, uh, uh, I guess, a leadership of, of, of sort of strength um, and uh, formed the, the, the Italian fascist party and convinced uh, Victor Emmanuel, who was the then king of, of, of Italy, to appoint him as prime minister. So he, like Hitler, came to power legitimately, legally. There was no coup. Um, but, um, yeah, I think he was probably a little less, uh, effective than Hitler was, you know, in general. Then, uh, and you spend some time with Stalin as well. Sure. Yeah. Got to talk about you, you cover, Uncle Joseph. You cover a lot in, in, these, <laughs> in this one course. We, we do. We do. Um, I think that uh, I want to I want to whet the kids appetites so that they hopefully will go on and study more of this when they get to university and, and study it in greater depth. Right. I think that's important. And you talked about Nanking as something that, you know, maybe that's not taught too often. We, we, we talk about World War Two a lot and that's kind of you know, I learned about World War II in high school, but I didn't learn so much about, you know, the the millions of people killed in 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 China, in China, and in Soviet Union. Those two countries um, feel like aren't as stressed as much as maybe the Holocaust, and I I don't know what the reason is for that, but I think that's equally as important to study and learn about. I mean, again, there are atrocities like this throughout history, and some receive greater uh, attention than others. I mean, I think the the awareness of the Holocaust is absolutely critical, um, but not necessarily at the expense of what happened in Nanking or what happened in the Congo under King Leopold, you know, mm -hmm. during the, the 1880s and 1890s. Again, I teach that in my Eurocif course, and eyes open up people are like i have no idea that went on in the congo i'm like yeah eight to ten million congolese died under the rule of leopold ii so you need to know about that mm -hmm. and you also make these courses and your curriculum real to your students by taking a core of students over to europe and it, on a typical summer you've done this in the past and i was looking forward to Going yeah, with you were you. with me. I was with you all the way. <laughs> um, but what is, what is it like as a a trip leader to see the kids like in the actual environment and and all of the learning that you do over the the course of the year kind of come to life and come to fruition in their mind? I have to tell you, I mean, that's perhaps the greatest reward is to see boys live history, um, and I try to make history very real in any way that I can either by sharing personal stories, because having lived in, in the UK for 10, 11 years, um, any, any opportunity I got, I was traveling uh, to France and to Belgium, to the battle sites, um, 
uh, dragging my wife along who was willing to go as long as we stayed in nice hotels and had nice meals. <laughs> so <laughs> she's been a she's been a great sport over the years in terms of my history interests. She's a history buff too? Uh, no, she is not. She's married to a history buff and except Okay. Uh, that's her cross to bear, I'm afraid. Okay. But uh, she's a willing, a willing traveler. So I, uh, but you know, I I've been to Normandy um, countless times, five, six, I think five times, and you know, I walk the beach every time, and I look up at the up at the heights um, above the beaches and try to envision what men were enduring in June of 44 when they landed and um you know the the American cemeteries at the top of of those cliffs um in Colville sur Mer and to walk those sites with the boys is it's just amazing um i remember two summer in 2018 um we were traveling from um we were we we sort of base ourselves down around um Normandy and that part of France for a couple of nights and then we travel north to um to the Ardennes and to go to where the Battle of the Bulge was fought that's another stop on the trip and on the way we made a detour and we went to um what's called the Loch Garnar crater and the Loch Garnar crater is at the front lines of the Somme so um you know that was fought in in July of 16 it opened up on July 1st of 16 and it opened up with a tremendous explosion um English miners had been uh digging under under the German lines at the Somme and they set off uh, this tremendous mine that created a crater that was um, 80 meters wide by 80 meters deep. And this was the opening salvo and um, you know the whistles blew and the men went over the top and started to walk toward the German lines. Um, but while we were there the poppies were in bloom. And for me, that is such an important symbol of, of the war and of remembrance. And I remember with the boys, I, I encouraged them. We walked out into the fields by the Loch Garner Crater and I said, each of you pick a poppy from this home and I want you to press it in a book and I want you to take this home and I want you to always remember that this is a real poppy from the home where these men fell in uh, in 1916 and I still have mine. So, I mean, I love to see history through the eyes of the boys, but for me, every time I go, there's a new experience that just brings things home to me. Wow, and that was just a stop on, on the way to- Just a stop on the way, but it's probably one of my favorite possessions now. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, it's one thing, I think, to look at it in a textbook or to hear a lecture about it. It's another thing to actually be there on site and see know what the what the men who were there saw and you know and and remember them in that way yeah and i i mean i collect military antiques i collect helmets i have helmets from every army of the great war i have helmets from world war ii um i have rifles from the great war and you know i can uh, when i clear it with security i can bring them in and and the, it means so much to the boys and the girls in the course to actually hold history mm -hmm. yeah it's amazing and, and talking to cesare too you, you, He's digitizing some of the films that you're showing in class. And um, I was lucky enough he, he shared some of those with good, me. So good. I'm looking forward to that. But I think film and, and watching, and, and that's definitely a part of your course that you lean on a lot. And it's, it's tough right now, I think, in this environment because I'm used to doing the same thing, showing movies and yeah. you know, clips in class. But it seems like you're making it work. Absolutely. I mean, we're really fortunate with regards to the Great War course. And I'm only speaking about that more because we're in that course this semester. But because we have just celebrated the centenary of the war, there have been so many books published. I mean, my personal library of, of, of books on the Great War, I, I must have 20 or 30 books, um, as well as tomes of primary resources that I've been able to gather. And um, But the films that have come out, two specifically, they Shall Not Grow Old by Peter Jackson, which came out two years ago, was one of the most amazing films I've ever seen. He was commissioned by the Imperial War Museum. Um, he could only use archival footage. Um, he took the footage from the archives and he corrected it for speed. And then he colorized it. And then he coupled the corrected footage with interviews that had been conducted with veterans of the Great War back in the 60s. So the BBC, when they produced the, the, the series, The Great War, which came out in 64, and was like a 24 episode series to commemorate 
the 50th anniversary of the start of the war, he uses those interviews as the narrative overlay for the footage. The reaction of the students over the past two years who have watched that film in my class is amazing. Just to to hear the voices of the men who actually fought and died and what they experienced coupled with colorized footage of the Great War is, it's it's kind of mind-blowing. It is. It's, it's almost unbelievable that he was able to do that. And it looks great. I mean, the, the visual quality of it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he does this, um, there's, I think the, there's a, there's a portion of the film which resonates with everyone who watches it. It's toward the end. And, um, you see the men who are sat in a, in a, a sort of a sunken road, um, at the battle of the Somme and they're waiting to go. So it's the morning of the Somme and they've been filmed and, you know, they're smoking, they're smiling, they're obviously concerned they're nervous and then once the battle begins peter jackson did this um he used a technique where he would focus on the face of a man sat there and then he would flash to a dead body on the field and then the man and then the dead body and he did this back and forth over and again and that you cannot be unmoved by that, to know that you were looking at men in the last hour of their life. Um, Mm -hmm. Tremendously impactful. Uh, And then the other film that we'll use, I hope we get to it, I mean, I don't have the opportunity to to, to watch everything, uh, is 1917, which you know came out a year ago. Uh, Again, brilliantly done, if if only to watch the film for its portrayal of No Man's Land. That in and of itself was you'll never think of no man's land again Mm -hmm. except for that film yeah that was an amazing one that Mm -hmm. that i watched when it came out so yeah um great well it sounds like this you know a couple awesome classes that you're teaching this year and you're doing my passion (laughs) yeah so how so i want to talk about that about how and this is what the really the podcast is is how you found all this and and now you you know every day you're giving life to it and teaching boys about what happened and all of your accumulation of knowledge, you know, that you've built over, over the years from, from when you were younger and you were saying, I, I loved military history ever since I went to McDonough growing up. So, um, what does it, you said you lived in England for a while and I want mm-hmm. to talk about maybe, you know, your time there mm-hmm. and how you found, uh, teaching as a profession. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So teaching is 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 my second career. And um, when I, I, I majored in history in college when I went to Cornell, uh, but when I graduated, I went to Wall Street um, only because it seemed to be the right thing to do. And most of my friends were trying to do it at the time. It was the mid 80s. And I was very fortunate to get a job at um, at J.P. Morgan. And I, and I went to Wall Street and worked in Manhattan for 10 years. And then um, met my wife. She was also working in investment banking and uh, we were married. And uh, within six months of getting married, uh, we were transferred to the UK. And so we both went over as bankers working for a firm called Bankers Trust. And uh, she she continued to work until my first son, William, was born. And after a year, um, I'm so grateful to her. She made the decision to uh, to raise our children. And we just felt that was so important that they be raised by at least one of us um, mm-hmm. and not someone else. So my wife stepped out after a very successful career. And I continued on um, with another firm called Credit Suisse First Boston. But living in, 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 in Europe, you have access to so much history. You're just surrounded by it. You cannot help but be um, absorbed into it. Uh, England is so rich in history. And as I said, I would plan a lot of our trips around historical destinations. So, uh, you know, when I read, I'm not a real fiction reader. I I read biographies and I read history. Uh, And uh, it's just, uh, it's where my interests lie. So, um, you know, after... After 21 years of banking, though, you know, I uh, my boys were young at that point. I had a uh, a six year old and an eight year old William and Austin, and um, my wife would say to me, 
you know, you're going to regret this. You're going to wake up one day if you keep going at this pace and you're not going to know your sons and you're not going to have spent time with me and you've had a good run, you've been blessed, you know, I think you should retire. And my wife was absolutely right. Uh, but I didn't take the decision lightly. It was something that I prayed about for a year consistently that uh, God would reveal a new purpose for me, another way that he would use me. And I really felt that he placed teaching and coaching on my heart. And it was a, it was quite a, it was a step of trust though. I had no idea how it was going to work, but what I knew I had to do was step out of the investment banking game. Uh, so I, um, I retired in, in 05 and uh, moved my family or no, I retired. Yeah, it was 05. I retired in 05 and uh, moved my family back to the States. We chose Atlanta because it was a big city with an international airport and great schools. And my boys were accepted to Westminster. And, um, and I set about trying to get a job teaching and it wasn't easy. Mm. Um, I had to work as a substitute teacher. I went back to uh, grad school uh, to get my master's in history at Georgia State. Um, but the one door that was opened quickly was coaching. Uh, because in 2005 in Georgia, there were not a lot of lacrosse coaches and the sport was beginning to take off. And when I, I met with the dean of faculty at Westminster, she tried to discourage me. And she said, well, go get a graduate degree, be a substitute teacher. I said, I'll do whatever it takes to get a job teaching here. But she immediately sent me to the AD. And she goes, I'm sending a guy down who's from Baltimore, who went to Calvert Hall, who plays lacrosse, see if we have a spot for him. I didn't get off campus that day without a, a lacrosse job. So I, I became an assistant coach uh, working for Tony Souza, who's the head coach, another Baltimore guy. And, uh, and that was my foot in the door. Yeah. Wow. Thank God for lacrosse. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm with it's, you there. It's, it's been a real uh, door opener for me. And um, within a year, a position opened in the history department and I just poured myself into it. And mm -hmm. I've been so blessed. I've been teaching European history for 16 years. I've been coaching lacrosse for 16 years. I've seen both of my sons. I coach both at the, uh, at the club level and at the, at the school. Um, and I've, it's just been an, a great opportunity to invest in, in the development of young men and women. I mean, I, I really am blessed. I, I thank God every day I get to get up and do exactly what I love. Right. Yeah, it's just your passion. And yeah. it, it, I've heard you say before that you loved what you were doing before. And, you know, you have that competitive mindset and you were, you know, you, were, you threw yourself into that profession as well. And it's it, totally a different way of life now, but it's sim similar. You're doing what you love every day. It yeah. sounds like. Yeah. I mean, you're all in. Yeah. That's great. Um, so what are some other things that you do here on campus at Gilman that we, we might want to cover? Um, advisory. Advisory. Yeah. That's big for you. And you have a great relationship yeah. with, with some of those guys. It's, I, I think that is an incredibly fulfilling part of the job. Um, and it was the same at Westminster before I came to Gilman and Westminster had, um, had a, had a similar model in that, um, you get boys as freshmen and you keep them until they're seniors. And for me to see young men make the transition from childhood to young adulthood is incredibly rewarding and it's never a, it's never a smooth four years. Everybody has their hiccups. Um, but the, you know, the degree to which you know someone after those four years of development is tremendous. And, um, I can tell you the name of every advisee that has come through my advisory at Gilman. I remain close with all of the boys, uh, regardless of where they are in university, some of them are already graduating, which mm -hmm. is hard to believe they're graduating from university at this point, some of my earliest advisees. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I call it, I, I call the role pastoral, right? Yeah. And now I don't mean acting as a pastor as much as it's like a shepherd. Right. <laughs> and, you know, we're called, as Henry says, to know and love the boys. And in my advisory, I would hope that's the way that they feel. 
Yeah, when they come in as freshmen, they're these little, you know, little guys from middle school and they're just meeting you and they're all nervous. And then when you send them out the door, they're ready to be on their own. Yeah. So it is it is a huge four years for high school boys and the development that happens. And I've only, and this is my first year as an advisor, but I'm enjoying to get to know the freshmen and all their questions. And right. I have a great group and I'm excited to see them progress. Yeah. And, you know, you, you make great friendships with families also. I mean, you're working in partnership with parents to raise their sons. And they're going to be things that their boys come to me about that they might not feel comfortable talking to their parents about. But it's just critical to be on the same page with parents. Mm -hmm. Like, I want you to know what my values are. I want you to know how I raised my sons, you know, what my wife and I, what our what our home life is like. I share all of this with them to say, that's what's going to, you know, uh, that's the style I'm going to use to help raise your sons. So working in partnership with parents is amazing. I would say for you, when you talk about your values and, and you're also the director, the head of the honor council here. So honor is obviously a huge value for you. How do you help high school boys kind of respect and, and live up to that, that core, it's core to Gilman, the Gilman five and, you know, being an honorable person, how do you help, uh, you know, share, you know, the values that you stress in your own house with, with the boys? I, um, I am Pat, you know, I am passionate about honor. And again, I think it goes all the way back to those early years at McDonough. Yeah. Uh, where, that was um, that was drilled into you, mm -hmm. and uh, literally drilled into you in yeah. those early years. I had no, I had no idea about your experience at McDonough, which is, we had one McDonough guy, Robbie Ford, on here before, but I, I wasn't even aware of that. So, and that's been such an influential part of your life. It sounds. Yeah, like. Yeah, I was pretty. I was one of the guys who was disappointed in '71 when they dropped the military because I had designs on being a cavalry officer one day, and, th and that all went out the door with the Vietnam War. So uh, we we were wearing blazers and slacks after that. But um, yeah, I think honor is just such a core uh, value to me, and it's. You know, the honor process at Gilman is is rewarding and it's challenging. Um, you know, we're here to help boys uh, develop. And the one thing that we know about um, teenage boys is that their ability to evaluate risk and reward is, is underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to make... Uh, good choices, and then there are going to be times when some boys make poor choices. And to me, the reward in honor is is helping them to learn from those poor choices such that when they get out into the real world, when the stakes are far greater, they have a well-developed sense of honor. And perhaps they've gone through a poor choice. Perhaps they've had to pay the consequences of that decision on their part. But... Um, it's learning from our mistakes. It's acknowledging that we all make mistakes and um, and then it's growing through the process. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time with regards to, um, you know, restorative measures because, you, you know, you make a you, you make a poor choice, you suffer the consequences. But we need to get the boys back on the horse, right? right? You're, it's it's not like you're going to wear a scarlet letter at Gilman. That's not the way we do things. Um, you're a member of the community, and and we're looking to restore you um, as an upstanding member of the community. But um, you know, honors it's a very personal thing. Yeah, you, you, you know, you say to the boys, honors about what you do when people aren't watching. Mm -hmm. Like, who are you? Yeah, you know, who are you? when you. All you've heard all of the cliches, you know, the man in the mirror. Like when you look in the mirror, who do you see? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's important. Especially during this time when we're virtual and, you know, I try to give some quizzes or some, not tests, but like just to make sure my, my boys are doing, doing the reading that's assigned. I can't, you know, lord over them like I usually would in a classroom. I just trust them at home to, you know, if you don't know an answer, you get one wrong. It's not a big deal. But if you cheat and just look it up and Google it, like we all could, like you have a computer in front of you, you could easily do that. But you go to Gilman and, and the honor is number one. Yeah, I um, I say that this it is tough. This, this virtual teaching is tough. And every time I give the boys an assessment, I, I remind them. I say, look, 
I know that if you set your mind to cheating, you can. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I trust you, right? And in the long run, if you cheat, you're cheating yourself. You may think you've gotten away with something on Coach Hudson, and and, and maybe you do. But you haven't learned the material. You've shortchanged yourself. And you're going to have trouble sleeping at night. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you see your 100% or whatever you get, you don't feel like you actually earned it. It's you cheapened. Even, you don't even feel good about it. <laughs> so... Um, that's great. And so how does the honor board and the honor council work here at Gilman? So um, it's a it's a it's a brilliant system that I inherited, um, but it is it is literally based on the concept of a jury of peers. So uh, the way that it works is uh, I'm the, the faculty chair of the honor committee and there's another faculty member who serves as the faculty advisor for the longest time. That was Mr. Donoso, um, but he has stepped down this year. And um, I'm looking for a new one. If you if you want to join as the faculty advisor of the honor committee, Jake, put your hand up. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to need someone. Fortunately, I haven't had to have any hearings so far this year, which is again a real blessing. Uh, but um, boys are selected by their peers, so um, each year one boy is selected from each form. So at the end of freshman year, for instance, they'll select one boy. Um, by sophomore year, we'll have two sophomores by junior year three juniors and by senior year we'll have four senior representatives plus uh the student body president so tucker hebert this year um and um and that and that's the way it works uh the boys are given the opportunity to uh to present their case to the committee in a hearing uh their advisor is involved the form chair is involved um, it really is quite an undertaking. It is very structured and formal in 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 the event of a, of a of a formal hearing. But um, you know, the boys that are selected by their peers are are, for all intents and purposes, honorable guys. And mm-hmm. it's not really a popularity contest. You know, we don't even allow if you serve as a as a class officer, you can't serve on the honor committee. because yeah. I don't I don't want the most popular guys on the honor committee. I want men of integrity. Right. And sometimes the class officer turns into a bit of like who's going to organize the events and who's popular and who knows people. But that is, does not necessarily equate to honor. No. When I think of the the boys that serve on honor, they tend to be very introspective. Um, they tend to be quieter. Mm-hmm. Um and I think it's wonderful that their peers have chosen them. That you know, the boys at Gilman are very sharp. And you know they can they can suss suss a real guy out versus kind of a joker or someone who's who's less than sincere. And I have never had an issue with anyone that's been elected and sent to honor for me. Just tells you that the Gilman boys take honor seriously too. They do. If they're electing the most honorable you know people for the council and they're not messing around with it or taking it as a joke, they obviously value that. You know, that tenant of the Gilman Five, I would say. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, so, Coach Hudson, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about your experience in this virtual world and how things are going for you and your classes. Maybe some things that work really well for your students. And because I think it's valuable for the people who are watching these podcasts and hopefully hopefully we get some viewers, but um, I'm sure we will uh, to kind of learn from each other since we don't have those lunch table conversations about what's working and what's what's falling flat and maybe some teachers are in a rut and kind of need some ideas and i even i've been getting ideas on the podcast like i tried something that beth knapp told me on the podcast in my class and it went pretty well so Mm -hmm. just curious is there anything you're doing that you think is working really well i don't think i'm doing i don't think i'm doing anything out of the ordinary, I found the transition from in-person to virtual last spring to be pretty smooth for me. Um, again, I am, uh, I'm, I'm kind of an in-person teacher, mm-hmm. so you're not going to get a lot of asynchronous assignments from me. I, whether I'm in a room with you or whether I'm on a Zoom uh, meeting with you, I, I want to be in person with you. So most of my classes are held via Zoom. Um, you know, I, you know, I think breakout rooms are an effective tool on zoom. I mean, I'm not telling you anything cutting edge, uh, but, um, you know, allowing the kids to, uh, to use uh, Flipgrid to, to kind of record themselves, to, to, 
to, uh, I, I like that as a platform. Uh, again, I'm not great with it. Um, also kids recording uh, brief videos and then uploading them and then allowing others to, uh, to kind of comment on, on what they've put together has been effective. But, you know, my guys really haven't seemed to skip a beat. I, I thank goodness we've had this in-person time. You know, if we went virtual from the beginning and never had the physical presence, it's tough to develop a meaningful relationship. But just the time that we've had between September and now when we've been physically present with the boys, I think has gone a long way for me in, you know, cementing those relationships. I mean, I think my one regret has been the fact that we don't have coordination with yeah. the tri-schools. And I have five uh, young women in my World War I course who are off the charts. Mm -hmm. And I would love nothing more to have them physically present in the room with the boys and me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully by the spring, um, things will be sorted out such that maybe we can do a little in-person coordination with the girls' schools. And I think four of the five uh, young women are taking World War II with me also. So they're like hardcore military historians too. Right. So like they got my respect already. I'm like, you guys are awesome. They're disciples of Hudson. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. I've, so I actually have taught the coordinate classes for the past two years. And this is my first year with just all boys. And mm -hmm. I do love teaching girls and guys in the same room, but one of my struggles that my first two years of teaching was kind of the awkwardness of the, the social dynamic between the girls and guys in class and found that tricky in the first, you know, my first year, really the whole year, but the second year, the first few weeks and months of getting people comfortable. But I found right away that with all guys, they're pretty comfortable with each other in terms of sharing out loud and having the type of conversation that I like to have in class. So I'm actually, I'm liking that, but I would agree it's it's valuable to get the girl's perspective on a lot of different things. Yeah, I see, I came from a, a different, uh, I came from a different perspective. So Westminster's co-ed. So for my first nine years of teaching, I was teaching men and women, young men and women together. I taught 11th and 12th grade at, at Westminster. And so when I arrived at Gilman, even though I had been, I had only attended all boys schools my whole life. Clearly I had forgotten. But when I arrived and went to my first assembly, I thought I am in an insane asylum. <laughs> like these boys are totally nuts. And um, there, was a, there was a wonderful innocence about it though. Um, without the distractions of young women in the classroom, boys can be boys and they can be goofy. And um, I think they can be very comfortable with one another, but that's not the real world. And uh, we're really fortunate to have two sister schools that are producing incredible young women. And so I love the fact that um, when we can, you know, we're, we're physically together um, in these coordinated classes. I think the coordinate program is such an important asset here. And, it is. You know, even though you get the taste of what it's like to be at an all boys school and have some of the focuses that typical all boys schools do, you also, in your 11th and in 12th grade year, get the experience of operating like what the real world is like and what college is going to be like. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, um, you know, the transition for my younger son, Austin. So when we moved to Gilman, Austin had been 10 years at Westminster. And so I asked him to make the move in his junior year, which was a, that's a tall ask. And, um, I don't, you know, I was watching him to see how he made the adjustment from having gone to a co-ed prep school to an all boys prep school. And I think by the end of his senior year, he was really happy to be at Gilman. He mm -hmm. was happy to be in that single sex environment with his very, very close friends. Um, he thrived here after sort of a tough year of transition. Wow. That's interesting. That's, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I got the single sex model. I was a product of it. Yeah. So awesome. Well, Kevin Hudson, it's been a pleasure to talk on the podcast and um, you're going down to South Carolina for a little bit for the holidays. You so got that right. safe travels. Enjoy the sunshine. Thank you, Jake. And uh, hopefully we get you back on here to talk some more history. And, you know, I could, we could talk all day about some of the things you teach, which 
you know, I'm glad we, we got into a little bit today. Well, thanks, Jake. I enjoyed speaking with you. I look forward to talking with you all again. Excellent.